Welcome back to another edition of Cape and Today. Today I am joined by Bob Booth. He is the director and curator of Manchester Historical Museum over on Union Street in Manchester by the Sea. How are you, Bob? Great to see you. I'm well, Corey. Thanks for the chance to talk to you. Oh, anytime. So right off the top, uh, we have an amazing exhibit uh, available for the public to, to view right now over at the museum. We do. We have a, a brand new exhibit called Manchester 1772 a small fishing town on the eve of revolution. That's 250 years ago. It's a big exhibit. We're using the outdoors as well as most of the inside of the exhibit area of the museum. And we're looking at this town of Manchester, which everyone sees as a pretty well-to-do kind of place these days, as a place 250 years ago that was just involved in subsistence fishing and farming. So it's a whole different culture. It's a culture that is at the very end of its existence within a British colony. 1772 is right on the eve of the revolution. I wanted to grab a look at these people who had been there for several generations, the descendants of the early settlers, creating a really tight uh, community that people felt very strongly they belonged in. And one of the things that we look at in this exhibit is what happens when you outgrow a little town like Manchester? Where do you go to seek your fortune? So it's a, it's a pretty down in the street look at something that people don't usually look at, which is a working class place, yeah. including uh, a good hard look at the elements of the cod fishery which in those days was the largest economic engine in all of Massachusetts. Manchester was a tiny town, but it played its part in this amazing industry of catching and then curing cod so that it could be an export, a stock in trade for a province that otherwise only had lumber as its stock in trade with the rest of the world. Right, and this, is, this period is before the Gilded Age in Manchester, obviously, correct? <laughs> it's a hundred years before the Gilded Age, Corey. Yeah. There is nothing gilded in Manchester in 1772. <laughs> so what um, components and features uh, make up this exhibit? So if you were to come, you would first encounter uh, the corner of a reproduced fish yard. So outdoors, we have created the elements of what was what was uh, a an area that used to extend all the way from Marblehead up to Gloucester, almost unbroken on the waterfront were these fish yards where fish by the tens of thousands of tons were being cured as they came back from the fishing grounds of Nova Scotia. So what you would find is a washout tub seven feet by five feet across, and it's real. That's a 200 year old relic. Mm. Um, it's a, a thing called a hand barrow that two men would carry the fish up into the fish yard in. There's a, an interpretive banner there. There's a tub of Spanish salt. Uh, Spanish salt was the key to the whole fishery. Once they got out on the fishing grounds, they would be there for three to four months. And it's before refrigeration. So every day's catch had to be salted down to preserve it. We've also got two types of fish flake which is a word for a kind of a rack or a table on which the fish, once it was brought back to port, would be laid out to be what they called cured. So we've also got a couple of reproduction fish fillets. These codfish generally range from 100 pounds to 120 pounds. So they were huge fish compared to what we think of as a cod today. And when they would clean the fish and bring it back to port, having been salted down, it would be in the shape of a, a sort of a large triangle called a fillet. So we've got two of these reproduction fillets and I have two real fillets, much smaller codfish because the hundred pounders don't exist anymore. So I'm actually curing a couple of real codfish out on these same fish flakes. Really? Yeah. That's impressive, yeah. Yeah. And and believe me, you can smell our fish yard before you see it. And that's authentic too. Phenomenal. Any, anyway, that's the outside. Once you're inside, we have 
devoted our exhibit gallery to a series of eight panels which describe various aspects of the town at, at the time of 1772. It's topography, who were the families, what were the kind of buildings they lived in, what did they do for work, what were their politics, what was it like to attend their church, how did they deal with illness and death, and then uh, final panel is looking at what happens when you outgrow a small town like Manchester, where do you go? What do you do? We also have a couple of display cases. One of them has all the gear of a fisherman that he would have taken to sea in the 1770s. Wow. And, and we have some domestic stuff too. We have a spinning wheel and a cobbler's bench. And it is true that there were three months during the year that the fishermen did not go out. They came home for the winter and when they lay over in the winter time, they um, spent a lot of that extra time hanging around with each other, passing a bottle of rum around, and cobbling shoes. So we've got some of that going on too. Amazing. So, Bob, I'm always fascinated by um, the work that goes into an exhibit such as this. So, can you just give me a bit of the backstory and and how all this came together? Sure. And I should also mention, we've got video. Um, yeah. I sent up a drone over Whittier's Cove by Tux Point so that people could see the original center of the fishery in the 1770s. That site is still there. Um, we also have about four or five minutes interpreting the agricultural methods of the day because Manchester, like all towns, also had some farming going on. So it is multimedia, and I thought of it that way from the beginning. As, as you say, you have to conceive of, of a, an exhibit before you put it together. It's nothing. It's just in your head, right? right. So I had originally conceived of it as uh, a look at the town in 1772 from a variety of perspectives, ways of looking at a community. And that ended up being the panels. And I, I did uh, short text. Uh, people don't want to stand there and read a book. They want to breeze through and get an impression. We also use, with each panel, uh, from the beginning, I knew I wanted good illustrations. So we were able to pull portraits and lithographs and prints and put them, uh, juxtapose those illustrations with the text. And then, uh, again, I thought video was important from the beginning. Fortunately, we've got a brand new big TV screen, so I wanted to make use of it. And uh, the final piece as I was sort of gaming out this exhibit was, what can we say about the fishery? And this was the most interesting thing to me. Again, the salt cod fishery was the most important business in Massachusetts for 200 years. If you go into the state house today, in the House of Representatives, in their chamber, what hangs over their head is a five-foot model of a codfish, the a sacred, sacred cod. cod. Yeah. yeah. But you try to find anything anywhere in Massachusetts that actually interprets this amazing business that everyone depended on, and there's nothing left. There's no material culture. All these fish flakes and barrels and washout tubs and hand barrows and all the things that went into not just the business of catching fish in schooners, but also curing the fish, which was a whole different art and science and involved thousands of Massachusetts citizens in the, in the process. Try and find even one scrap of any of that. It is gone. So I was determined to be able to reproduce at least what would be the corner of a fish yard with a variety of different elements. And since there was nothing I could get that could be loaned, since it didn't exist, I reached out all the way to Nova Scotia. And it turns out that in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, which has the wonderful Museum of the Atlantic Fisheries, including the, the schooner Blue Nose that used to race against the Gloucestermen, yeah. uh, I have a friend there, Adrian Morrison, who runs that museum. And it happened that Adrian was deaccessioning some of their fish yard collection just at that moment. 
So I was <laughs> incredibly, I was able to grab uh, an authentic washout tub and an authentic hand barrow and some other um, elements, particularly the fisherman's gear that were that had actually been used in the fish yards and on board the schooners. So, so now, I guess alone in Massachusetts, we've actually got the things that were used in a fish yard or that were worn by the fishermen. And I also have to put in a plug for Jeff Parker, who is associated with our historical museum. Jeff built two fantastic reproduction fish flakes mm. uh, in a matter of about 48 hours. So we've got the whole deal. We've got also uh, reproduction fish fillets that were made by Martha Chapman out of uh, old Peabody leather and painted up to look like fish. So a lot of creativity went into it. Uh, the material culture part of it, I really wasn't sure it could come together. It's a different country, you know, Canada, and we had to get this stuff freighted down in time. Mm. But, but I felt like this would be a huge impact if we could do it. And I, I also want to say that at the time that Manchester did its Festival by the Sea, uh, we were able to get uh, the services of a group called uh, the Ladies Society of the American Revolution reenactors who came down uh, and and sort of relating to the authenticity of the fish yard. Here were five women who were in complete authentic period dress from 1772. And they even did some of the scholarship of what Manchester was like at that time. So we, we've done a lot of different, uh, as I say, from the beginning, I wanted it to be multimedia. I wanted to have reenactors. I wanted it to be outside. I wanted to build something that would be permanent to Manchester. And frankly, that would be um, maybe a benefit to everyone in Massachusetts to be able to get a look at what a fish yard really was. Mm, nicely put, Bob. So now if people want to go and see the exhibit. How can they go about doing that? Okay, well, we so should say this is free to the public as well, right, Bob? It is free to the public. Mm -hmm. If you feel inspired to make a donation, we won't try to stop you. Yeah. Uh, the the fish yard is uh, open all the time. It's outdoors, but our hours these days are Tuesday through Sunday. This was a museum that wasn't open, uh, generally speaking, a lot on the weekends, and that's something that's changed. So we want to be open. We want the public to come through. Generally speaking, we're open ten to three, Tuesday. Tuesdays through Saturdays, and then one to four on Sundays. Gotcha. And if people want to learn more about Manchester Historical Museum, how can they go about doing that? Well, actually, the, the best thing is to uh, go on the website, I suppose. We're in the process of building a brand new one. Um, the, one the one that we have is serviceable, but not what it's going to be. Um, and, and I guess the, the other thing I can say is please feel free to just come by, drop in. Uh, we are trying to make a real effort to welcome people into a place that has seen seemed to be maybe in the past a little forbidding or uh, or difficult to access. We'll put it that way. Well, I've enjoyed many an hour at the Manchester Historical Museum. I have a great partnership with MHM as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing this exhibit, Bob, uh, and getting to know you better and work with you in the future. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, so thanks again for your time. And uh, folks, when is this exhibit running through, Bob? Right. So uh, it'll be running through the, um, the rest of the week of Labor Day week. So I guess that it'll close on the 8th or something like that. Gotcha. I've extended it by by a week. Uh, we seem to be getting a lot more momentum. We actually had 120 people on premises in early August. So, oh wow, nice. Words yeah. out, words Beautiful. out. Yeah. Well, let, let's continue the conversation and be looking forward to seeing what uh, the historical museum has coming up next. Great, glad to be with you, Corey. Interested in a sponsorship? Email sponsor at 1623studios.org to learn more.